Thank you. All right. So I'd like to call this um, meeting of the Assembly Rules Committee meeting um, to order. We're noticed today from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, let's go ahead and uh, start with a roll call, please. Yes, um, Felix Rivera. Present. John Weddleton. Here. Jamie Allard. Christopher Constant. Forrest Dunbar. Here. Crystal Kennedy. Here. Suzanne LaFrance. Cameron Perez Verdia. I'm here, yes. Pete Peterson. Present. Meg Zalatel. Here. You have a quorum. And I see Miss <laughs> Allard has joined. Yes, Here. I see that too. Great, thank you. All right, so um, as normal, if folks wanna get in the queue, please put yourself in the chat or if you can't access the queue, please text um, and I can add you in the chat, in, in the queue, excuse me. Um, as normal for rules committee meetings, um, we can keep these uh, somewhat informal. Uh, so uh, feel free to use first names, that, that is, totally fine um all right let's start uh getting to it there's a a bit it's a short agenda but a lot to it so um we're gonna go ahead and start with the report from the assembly chair and municipal clerk so i'll go ahead and start so just general comment i want to thank everyone for all of your hard work and understanding over these last few rough weeks and i want to thank you in advance for what will likely be a very busy November and possibly even December, but more on that later. Um, okay, so first, uh, let me actually do something really quick. So um, I am going to for, uh, and actually, Barbara, I'm going to be sharing my screen okay, here. Right. Uh, let's see. Voila. All right. So um, for these reports, because I, I know I sometimes throw a lot at you guys in these reports, uh, I'm going to um, start making a slide presentation so that you can refer back to some of the pieces. This isn't going to include everything, so I'm still going to be throwing some things at you that aren't included in here. Um, but this does cover some of the uh, points of interest that I think the body might want to come back to and, and and review. So first, alcohol tax. So as was emailed to the body earlier this week, the alcohol tax work session was moved to next Thursday, November 5th at 12.40 p.m. to allow for more time to get a new version of the tax allocations, which I think will more closely mirror the discussions the Assembly has had over the last several months. Again, if you'd like more details, please reach out directly to Jason Bockenstead and he can uh, talk you through that. Um, next, the I Can't Breathe resolution. So I've been talking about this for several months now and giving you all updates um, and been working with the clerk's office to track some of the key uh, pieces of the resolution that we passed on June 2nd. Uh, as I've stated to several assembly members, and I'm sure the clerk can go into this in more detail during uh, her report, Barbara can, um, but the clerk's office has been uh, overwhelmed of late. <laughs> They've had a lot of work to do. So we haven't made as much headway on some of the pieces of this as I'd like, but we have scheduled a first of a, of a three part training uh, that was one of the actions outlined in the resolution. Uh, so it is an all day training that's going to be in two parts. The morning session is going to be run by First Alaskans Institute and the afternoon session is going to be run by Sonia Hunt, which if you don't know Sonia, she's wonderful. She is the senior director of the Office of Equity and Compliance in the school district. So she has a lot of experience and expertise in running these kinds of uh, dialogues and discussions, as does First Alaskans. 
Um, so the clerk's office did send some introductory material, but from what I understand, the trainers should be reaching out soon with a more formal letter introducing what we're going to be doing on November 6th. So appreciate everyone's willingness to attend uh, and if if you're able to attend. Um, OK, so first thing uh, for the slide. So the update on the assembly office remodel. So last week I gave approval to move forward on the latest design for the assembly offices in City Hall. Um, so um, I think when I talked to you all about this last month, uh, the design didn't have the full number of offices that I felt that we needed, which is 10 offices. Um, so now the design does have 10 offices, one meeting room and a reception area. The offices are mostly similar in size, which was a concern that was brought up with, of course, uh, as you can probably see, <laughs> one office there being a little bit bigger than the others. Um, we will figure out some way to determine who gets which offices. I don't want us, this to be a, a, a competition. Likely it'll be by seniority or something fair like that. Um, so I'm not sure if we're still on track to be done with the remodel by December, which was the original plan, but that's what I'm hoping for. Uh, and also from what I understand, Chris Schutte has been working with the Chugach Eagle River members to find office space, uh, two offices for them as well out uh, in Chugach Eagle River. So um, hopefully the, the two offices can be, the City Hall offices and the Chugach Eagle River offices can be done concurrently so that we all can have our offices at the same time. Um, next is utilizing the assembly chambers. So um, Barbara, Crystal, and a host of IT and other staff helped run a test of a committee meeting using the assembly chambers and a virtual format. We used, uh, we tried out Teams Live on base, a, a bunch of different formats. Um, so there are still tweaks that are being worked out and cost assessments, because this is going to cost us money, that are still being put together. Uh, so once I have all of that information, I'll be able to make an informed decision on how to move forward with this request. The clerk's office suggests that we start small to maintain the quality of our meetings. So um, rather than trying to do all of the committee meetings at once, really do a test and quality runs with just a couple of committee meetings. So. Um, the guidance that I have given is that we begin with likely the health policy and public safety committee meetings as our um, guinea pigs, um, and, and hopefully you all are okay with that. Um, these committee meetings are typically back to back, which makes it easier, I think, for our staff to be able to manage that. Um, so all of these details are though still being sorted out, and I imagine that our first official test run of the system is going to be in December. So nothing I think to worry about for November. Um, as, a, as a note to the members, um, I, I'm going to just keep running through my report and then we'll we'll do any questions or discussion at the end. Um, OK, redo of the assembly website. So the last time that I updated the body on a redo of our website, it was still up in the air on whether OMB would approve us moving uh, the 2020 budget dollars to 2021. Thankfully, that has been resolved and we have received approval. So right now we are still waiting for purchasing to go through the process of renewing the RDI contract that should be done in mid-November, hopefully. After that, we'll start going through the process of creating a purchase order for this project and RDI should be able to get started in November or December. So that delays the completion of this project to sometime in first quarter of 2021. There is a working group that's been formed to assist RDI and, and um, so that we make sure our website does what we want it to do. So I believe it's John Weddleton and, and is it Meg? I, f I forget who the other assembly member working on it is. Um, and then um, Barbara and Jennifer um, are also in that working group. Um, next. So so I wanted to do a quick report um, on the FCC presentation I gave. I gave. So on October 21st, I gave a presentation to the FCC, Federation of Community Councils, 
about the public hearing process, which was a recommendation that came out of this committee in August. Um, so they gave, gave a variety of uh, helpful suggestions, but overall, overall, there was not an indication that we needed to do a complete overhaul of our public hearing process. So um, what they said is ensure quality of audio during live streaming and recordings of meetings. They gave a variety of suggestions to help individuals watching online or TV to better track and follow what's going on in the meeting. And um, in particular, these suggestions were given because most of our community council leadership, they're watching our meetings online or they're watching them on TV. They're not coming in person like they might normally to um, uh, be with us at the chambers for our meetings. They also suggested a possible a one pager guideline on how to testify, which is something that's already in process. The, the communications subcommittee um, worked to create this when they fleshed out the idea of a navigator program, which we um, thankfully to Christy and Heather coming on board. Um, we uh, sort of quasi began <laughs> the navigator program this last uh, meeting and hope to continue that in some fashion with at least Christy and Heather as long as they're with us through the end of December. Um, and then there was also general agreement with a provision in the 2013 Citizens Task Force report uh, about discussion of controversial issues happening in the community in some type of public forum prior to them being introduced and put on the assembly agenda. There wasn't really any guidance on, you know, how to implement that, but but there is there was general agreement by the FCC that we should try to do that. And um, so that's going to really be up to us and, and discussions with the administration, because I mean, most of the quote unquote controversial issues, which again, that's in the eye of the beholder, but most of the controversial issues that we've seen of late have been introduced by the administration. There's been some that's been introduced by assembly members. Um, so that will just require us um, uh, just thinking about that in advance and um, really maybe bringing it up at a rules committee meeting or bringing it up to assembly leadership uh, to see if we want to actually enact and, and follow this provision that was in the 2013 Citizens Task Force. Um, so that was that presentation. Next, I wanted to give an update on um, what our aides have been doing, uh, and specifically the COVID-19 aides that were brought on board, so Christy Tanaka and Heather Ireland, as well as our communications uh, assistant brought on board, Marissa, uh, and apologies, I don't remember her last name. Um, so as required, Desiree receives a bi-weekly report from our three staff brought on through the use of the CARES Act funds. And I'm gonna be sharing the work that they have done in rules as part of my regular report. So one of the aides, Christy, has been working on one of my requests to develop an Anchorage version of Newark Working Kitchen. So if you don't know that program, I would suggest Googling it. One of our constituents actually did email us about this program some time ago. Unbeknownst to me, United Way and the Alaska Hospitality Retailers were already working on um, a pilot program like this, um, which Christy learned through her work contacting local stakeholders. Christy, at my direction, has joined the planning team for this effort and is helping them move forward. In short, this is a program that is going to deal with food insecurity, which the food bank Alaska expects to grow in significantly in early 2021. They expect in uh, early 2021, around first quarter time, um, to be up to 20,000 new individuals in Anchorage becoming food insecure. So this program also has the added benefit of helping restaurants uh, stay in business and keep their workers employed and help catering companies and the taxi TNC industry who have been hurting significantly by the pandemic. United Way secured $650,000 in funding to run the pilot program through the end of the year. And Christy and I are working with the other program partners to see if we can scale and continue this program through early 2021. The second aid, Heather, has been working with Meg on a CARES Act survey to obtain information on the accessibility of funding for individuals and small businesses. So both of these surveys inquire about 
um, the mechanics and ease of accessing funding programs, as well as if particular funding was sought by um, was sought but not available. So looking forward to, to the results of that survey. Um, our communications assistant, Marissa, has been sending you all plenty of uh, material for social media related to the budget and our COVID-19 efforts. I've also assigned Marissa as the point person to get updates done for our Coronavirus Relief Fund website working with Northwest Strategies. So if you all have additional work for aides or communications personnel, please feel free to reach out. They are here to help and they are happy to help. Um, also wanted to, to uh, walk you guys through any type of policy changes that uh, are being made by leadership. Um, uh, Cause sometimes uh, changes are made and they're emailed. So I always do my best to email and keep you all in the loop. But um, as you all know, we're inundated by email and sometimes things get lost. So I wanna try to make sure uh, you all are in the loop. So there's two policy changes that have been made recently in the last like month or two. So first is scheduling of meetings so that we don't conflict with the ASD class schedule. And in short, what that looks like is avoiding Thursday and some afternoons if possible. So that's why you've seen um, CEDC and budget uh, finance and enterprise and utilities move their meetings sometimes when they can. And then second uh, policy change is around recognition resolutions. So um, for new resolutions folks aren't automatically added the clerk's office is going to send out an email asking if you want to be added to any new resolutions so uh, our regular calendar of resolutions which the clerk's office keeps i don't know how many of them are there are a lot that's on our regular annual calendar everyone's on those unless you've asked the clerk's office to take you off of any of them um okay i think that yeah. is it for me um, anything yeah. else that members would like me to report on or, or any questions? And let me stop sharing so I can see. Sorry about that. I went to stop sharing and I clicked hang up. Um, okay. So, uh, uh, let's see. Barbara, you're in the queue. <laughs> Thank you, Felix. I just wanted to make sure that um, everyone understands for the the email that members are going to get on the recognition resolutions. That is going to be for the annual recognition resolutions. We probably aren't going to be able to do that on the one off resolution. So, for example, if you submit a resolution um, recognizing someone and it's and you get it into the addendum today at before noon, we won't have time to ask if members want to co sponsor that before we publish the agenda. So for those recognitions, the one-offs, you're just going to have to say at the meeting or you're going to have to email us and say, please add me to that and we'll add you to the final. So basically, instead of the clerk's office coming to you with an email, you can come to us with an email or say something on the record. Thanks for that clarification, Barbara. Uh, John? Um, well, a couple of things. Is, is this time to discuss some of the points you made? Yeah, if you want to talk about anything in the presentation, okay. feel free to. Yeah, I, a couple of points. One is, you know, the, um, you know, with the request to have um, controversial things discussed before introduction, that's exactly what community councils are for, you know, and I think when we have ideas that we're working on, that's time up. often we bring them up and talk about them to our community council and I suppose we go to FCC but I mean that's totally what they exist for so I don't know if maybe we need to do that better but to create a whole new routine seems um might almost be, be it'd be risky um and, and the sound quality you know we've gotten some emails some people are saying that um w when people are testifying on the phone it comes through echoed and you know when I found I called in last 
week and it was fine. But you know, we're on a different phone line. Is that? I mean, is there, so are we still working on these things? Yeah. So Barbara will talk about that when she gives uh, her report and updates on what's going on with sound quality and everything. Um, I'll speak to your first point though. So yeah, so when the FCC sort of, I will say individual delegates, the FCC didn't take a vote or anything, but when individual delegates mentioned uh, you should uh, try to do this type of, um, you know, public outreach and forums before introduction, they didn't really give guidance on whether to do that in community councils or whether to do that in special forums or, you know, how exactly to get that done. Um, you know, I, I will say, and as we've seen some members of the public come and testify us, they've told us community councils aren't good enough. Not everyone goes to community councils. Um, and I know, John, you, you're a huge advocate of them and you want everyone to go to community councils, but I think there's maybe uh, sort of a, uh, bit of a little bit of a reality check of, of who actually goes. So it's a good discussion that we can continue having on how exactly we get these kinds of controversial issues out to the public in the appropriate type of forum before they're on the agenda. Well, could I follow up on that then? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, you know, I agree. You, you, community, and it depends on the community council. I mean, some are very dynamic and draw a big crowd and so on. But any reason that someone may not go to the community council would probably be the same reason they wouldn't go to anything else we set up. You know, they're busy that evening. Um, but if we give, if community councils are the forum for things like this that are important to people, then people will show up. So, you know, it's, it's almost when you get community councils doing what community councils are supposed to be doing, then people do show up. And, you know, so it's like that or that structure is already there. You know, it's like, let's take advantage of it. Um, also, I, I think we saw at the Abilou Community Council yesterday, there was a good turnout. There's some new people there and they were engaged. You know, it was very good. So I think as we've, uh, and community councils have embraced, you know, online meetings, it's actually made them draw more people. So, you know, so I, I would, anyway, for me, that's my forum for doing that stuff. And I think it can work. And if more of them, become known for, you know, the first place to go for information on city stuff. Well, that's exactly what they're for. And I think more people will come. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, John. Meg? Um, thanks. So two things. Um, first is uh, I'd like to put the Assembly's Committee on Homelessness up at the list for possibly getting into chamber sooner than later. I've had a lot of folks email very frustrated um, not just the most vocal one we've heard from during the meetings um, about accessing the meetings or feeling like they can track what's going on. And we usually get really large attendance with those meetings. Um, so I would like to prioritize that meeting um, if it's doable. Um, and then on the idea of controversial items, um, I've been really thinking about this a lot. And when we said we were going to, uh, when we voted and decided we were going to set the emergency declaration, any potential continuation of it for public hearing, I started emailing the Midtown Community Councils asking if they could raise this issue at their community council meetings so we could have the opportunity to hear in that forum. Um, I would say overall, I believe the Midtown based community councils and there are nine we cover uh, some with other members like Abbott Loop or University Area have had really good participation through um, Zoom. Um, we've had a few just that haven't met though because they want to only in person um, and so we're not hearing anything from them. Um, so I think it's tricky. Um, it's also tricky when I emailed one community council, the community council president asked if there was a draft resolution and I said no, this was simply an item for discussion because we just wanted to hear what the public thought, not um, any particular outcome. Um, so I, I think it's it's one of those things that's really hard to get at, but hopefully either through telegraphing through committees as well. If we know something's coming up related to a committee, perhaps we could be raising it, um, even if we don't have the opportunity to uh, d dive deep into it in the committee meeting, but then we're at least alerting those who are interested in issues that are related to whatever the potential controversial item might be to get in touch with us. So just a few thoughts there. And um, it's something I've definitely been thinking a lot about. And we could 
continue to talk about this in the communication subcommittee too if uh, we want to try to come up with some more strategies. Thanks. Yeah, and um, happy to talk with the clerk's office about um, if we can add one more committee and do homelessness. So we have three committees that are in person in December. Um, and, and, you know, making some assumptions here that um, uh, about the trajectory of the pandemic, et cetera. But um, yeah, we, we can we can try to add homelessness uh, into the mix, but I'll talk with the clerk's office about it. Uh, and then, um, yeah, thanks for that second point. You know, we do have a lot of structures we in place already. Community councils, uh, um, rules committee has traditionally been a good place to review drafts of ordinances uh, and different committee meetings as well. So um, happy to have the subcommittee, communication subcommittee keep chewing on this idea. Um, I think that's a good idea. Um, okay, I'm not seeing anyone else in the queue. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Barbara. Thank you, Felix. Um, so I will get to um, John's question. That, of course, is one of my points. I always talk to you about three things. Um, number one, I'm going to tell you that at least me and some of us in the clerk's office are suffering from COVID fatigue. I think that it's really hard for all of us to be on such high alert for so long. And, you know, we have been on high alert. Everyone's working hard. The assembly is working hard. You're having more meetings. We've created new technology. We're struggling a little bit with the new technology, with the telephones, with um, on base, which really isn't related to COVID, um, but with teams, occasionally we've had some issues. And then one of the other things that I think is happening with all of us is we're getting more and more calls and people are upset and angry. And I think that that um, increases the stress in the clerk's office. So I think you probably are all aware of that, but I think I'd be negligent if I didn't tell you that's a concern for me. Um, the second thing I want to talk to you about is the projects that we're working on, and I'll just talk about a couple of those. But the first one is the sound in the chambers. And, you know, we really thought we were done with this project. We were ready to close it out, and then we had Tuesday night. So we have um, reopened the project. OIT and the video center, John Crabb, is working on it. Um, they're trying to find a different issue to modulate the sound. And I think John Weddleton is right. The problem happens with people on the phone, you know, with all of the different sound systems that are really blowing out the audio when they sound chambers. So people are gonna start getting emails from the clerk's office um, on Tuesdays, and we're going to remind everyone that's remote that you need to wear a headset, because if you wear a headset, we're not getting an echo from your um, phone that that's coming back into the system. And so I know all the assembly members should be set up with a headset but we're gonna have to ask the administration to do the same thing. So if you're, I see a couple of people participating, Alex is on the phone right now, but I think you understand that some of the people that were participating on the phone on the administration line, they were the ones that were blowing out the sound and, um, and then the sound modulates after somebody blows it out and then you can't hear the next person. And so it's kind of a little bit of a struggle there. But all I can tell you is that we're working on it. And if you do get an email, if you don't have a headset, pick up the handset and speak on the handset. Do not use speakerphone because that's what seems to be killing us. Um, so that was one project that we're working on. A second project is radio, so I have some good news um, about radio. Oh, I'm going to go back to 
Cameron's question, what do you mean by blowing out? Well, I don't know if you weren't there, but I, I think several of you saw me jump. The sound is just so loud when someone on the phone um, is, is on a speaker phone, they hit the top of the sound bar and then the sound system says, oh my gosh, this is so loud. Let me reduce the sound. And so when the next person comes in, it's super soft. And then the person comes in that's really loud and it, it blows it off the top of the sound again. And that's what caused that reverberation and makes it impossible to get a consistent sound from person to person. Um, so, um, Ms. Aller, did you have a question for me? I do. I just wanted to know if you could add this to maybe, if you could talk about it. I've had some complaints, I guess, twice in the last uh, September, once in October. The Pledge of Allegiance is given, the camera is not on. Um, the screen going black on people's laptops. The camera is turned off during breaks or when there's call for a recess. So if chair says, okay, we're going to take a quick break, people feel like they're missing information and they want that to stay on. I know I also spoke to Dean about the loop in the chamber, but I have to, and he said it could be another 60 days. I have to tell you, it's affecting my work. And I think 60 days to wait for a loop to go into the facility. I, I can't wait that long. I've been waiting already almost 60 days for my hearing aid thing. So I don't know who else to address it to, um, but I, I really need it addressed. So I'm bringing it up in this rules committee because I'm not sure where else to go. Thanks, Barbara. So I will um, I will address the, the cameras and just so that I understand your um, the concern is that the cameras go off during the break and that the cameras are not on during the pledge. Correct, or the recesses. So they are requesting that the cameras stay on for the entire duration of the meeting as if they're sitting there in the chambers with us. Um, I, I'm not sure that that's possible, Ms. Allard, but I will talk to the video center and um, we will get back to you about that. They certainly should be on during the pledge. I have no idea why that is happening, but I will address that. I am sorry I cannot address the question of the loop. I am not involved in that. That would be something the chair needs to address for you. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not really involved in it either. It's something that, that Dean is working on. Um, so Dean, the last, last update he gave me on Tuesday about this was um, so Dean is working to get in uh, an ITB uh, on um, how much the and then mm -hmm. we're looking once I have a better uh, understanding of how much this would cost then uh, we would look at uh, incorporating it into the budget I think is is the plan of action but dean if you if you know more you can add now uh hello mr chair uh yes we have sort of a rough estimate of cost uh so it's really really so so because it's not from actual people that would do this kind of work but um i'm i've also started to talk about drafting the uh, invitation to bid for this work that would need to be done. And uh, I've contacting, well, trying to uh, identify maybe potential funding for this. Um, so with our ADA coordinator and with our assembly budget and uh, so forth. So it's in, it's in the works. It's not so simple though. Uh, just to give you an idea, it requires installing some metal they're sort of wiring or ribbons uh on the floor beneath the carpeting and it's set out like a grid so the work is involves um unbolting all of the chairs and chambers and the carpeting lifting it up and then putting that in and then reinstalling the carpeting and chairs 
but it would be really a great uh, addition to chambers and accommodation for a lot of people that come to our meetings that use hearing aids. They would have so much better clarity by using uh, a T coil switch that's very um, kind of standard in almost all hearing aids and gives them a direct uh, connection to our audio equipment rather than an acoustic uh, sort of reception. I don't know if that helps, but um, anyway, uh, it's it's not a straightforward project. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So um, yeah, Jamie, what, what I'll tell you is I'll, I'll keep getting weekly updates on how this is going, and I'm, I'm happy to keep you in the loop. <laughs> no pun intended. That sounds great. Thank you, Felix. <laughs> Thanks. Um, OK, we'll, we'll go ahead and go to Crystal. And I think Barbara probably has more in her report. But go ahead, Crystal. Oh, thank you. Yeah, my comment was just about the um, uh, video uh, that you have on the web, the, on the Muni website. And um, one of the things I noticed is that when we do go to a break, you know, I keep it up. It's always a minute or so behind, but I keep it up just so that I can kind of see who's speaking and, and, and rather than just hearing them on the phone. Um, but I have noticed that when you go to a break and uh, the video stops, uh, it'll say video not available and um, it'll oftentimes just totally kick me off. And so I have to go back in and refresh um, the uh, website and then go find the video again and get get back on. So um, that is one of the problems with, with shutting it off during those breaks. And I don't know if other people are experiencing that, but that's been, that has definitely been experienced. So just uh, making you aware of that. Thanks. Um, Crystal, I would like to talk to you about um, about the what you're experience experiencing. There's two types of videos. There's the on base video, and then there's the GCI video. So I want to make sure I understand um, what you're seeing and that we're doing it correctly. So. Um, I was telling you the sound is one project. The other project that I was going to talk to you about is radio. We're working with Chris Constant on getting the assembly meetings broadcast on radio. And we should have a meeting this week with UAA, KRUA. And it looks like assembly meetings will be broadcast on radio before the end of this year, which is pretty exciting. Um, the next project that I wanted to talk to you about was the AIDS. And um, I really appreciate Felix introducing um, Christy Tanaka and um, um, Heather Ireland at the last meeting. Um, and John, you kind of inspired us a little bit about that at the chair meeting. Um, we have provided um, Christy and Heather, the navigator information that we've been um, working on at the um, communications subcommittee. And Christy and Heather did the job on Tuesday night. They were there passing out agendas. They were showing people where items were in the agenda. They helped a couple of people at the Wilda Marston that we're here to testify on the building code amendments. So I think it really helps a lot. Travis made a noticeable comment about fewer people coming up to him and asking questions because we had Heather and Christy there. So um, thank you again um, for um, your support of that. The um, other thing that I wanted to tell you about the AIDS is that um, the clerk's office had, um, and we appreciate that you set a little money aside for the clerk's office for the um, CARES Act of AIDS. And John and Crystal and Desiree and I had an interview yesterday and um, we're ready to make an offer for an aid to provide some IT and other administrative assistance in the clerk's office. And I think this is gonna go a lot towards working on 
um, you know, moving some of the committee meetings, increasing our technology, making sure that the clerk's office is um, deeper than just single threaded with um, Desiree being our um, Microsoft Teams expert. So hopefully we'll have another aide that'll be helping us with that. And um, it, she was super enthusiastic and noticeably did not have COVID fatigue. So I'm really excited about bringing her on board. The third thing that I wanted to talk to you about was just the regular work in the clerk's office. We've got um, four Board of Adjustment Appeals. We have interestingly got the Anchorage Downtown Partnership Assessment Role. This is going to be really exciting for us to do this. And for those of you that, that know, the APD, vote, a, the Anchorage Downtown Partnership votes every 10 years on its assessment role. And so this hasn't happened since 2010. So we're kind of learning um, how this needs to be done. We're still working with um, um, on-base agenda and we have a couple of bumps and we're working on some business rules, but we're, we're doing okay on that. I think you're gonna see the minutes get completed um, more um, timely because of the new system. We're also working on budget and the anti-racism training um, and the staff is doing some pretty good things with social media if you're following us. And um, I think they're, they're doing a great job um, in spite of these difficult times and circumstances that we find ourselves in. And if you have any questions for me or the staff, you can please let me know. Thanks, Barbara. Um, so just want to note for the record, we've been joined by Suzanne LaFrance. Um, she joined us a bit ago. And um, Meg had a comment about uh, radio was reviewed via the communications subcommittee and supported. Um, were there any other questions for Barbara? All right, not seeing any. Awesome. Thanks so much, Barbara. <laughs> um, Okay, so then we're going to go ahead and move on in our agenda. Um, so item B in our uh, agenda, assembly priorities. Um, I've been, the main item under this part of the agenda has been the quarterly comprehensive update. So um, Northwest Strategies has begun working on the design of the first update, which as you might know, if you've done this kind of work, the first publication of something new always takes a long time to get done so they should get something uh for review to us soon but they've i've been working with them back and forth and we're um we're almost there to get something done um then moving on in our agenda to uh, item C, assembly member discussion on pending business and update from committees, upcoming business. So I'm just going to go ahead and go in order of the participants as I see them, which I believe is an alpha order. And um, so if assembly members have any individual business that they are doing or any committee business that they are doing, uh, feel free to let us know. Um, so we'll go ahead and start with Jamie. Did you just ask me, Felix? Yes. Uh, can I pass for right now? Sure, fair enough. Uh, next, I see Forrest. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't think I have anything additional today. Um, I think I, like everyone else, I'm just working right now on the budget and some of the other larger items that are before us and thinking of amendments for them, but nothing I'm ready to debut here. And uh, my goal for the rest of the year is not to propose any large controversial ordinances or resolutions, but we'll see if uh, I'm able to stick to that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next I have Crystal. Um, okay, well, um, I guess I, I have um, one thing. Um, I, I wanted a little, well, 
maybe I just have some questions, I guess. Um, one of the things that uh, I I want to make mention of is that the agenda to go is a great tool, but it's um, kind of slow sometimes in getting updated. Like right now, it doesn't have the November 4th meeting on it yet, and that's only three days or four days away, I guess. Five days? Yeah. Anyway, um, and then I guess I want to talk a little bit about the, the meeting dates for, for committee meetings. We were talking about the, you mentioned that you didn't really want them on on Thursdays. Um, and I, I didn't really hear that message. I just heard that it was a timing issue on Thursdays. So thought maybe some clarification on that. But um, otherwise, you know, I'm just kind of busy right now with um, watching our um, mobile home park out here in the Chugach Eagle River area. I don't know that there's really any kind of uh, uh, anything to really work on with that other than just getting various departments in the state to coordinate over some efforts. So I'm not really working on any uh, ordinances on that. Um, but it is an interesting kind of um, situation that I think we might need to monitor a little bit just in terms of how it could impact uh, of our other mobile home parks. Um, so anyway, I guess I'm just asking people to kind of keep some of that in the back of their mind to see if there are some things that that maybe we need to, to look into just to make sure that that these mobile home parks, which are incredibly, you know, so a lot of the infrastructure for them is incredibly old. A lot of the mobile homes themselves are incredibly old and though they are not really easily repaired. Um, so anyway, um, like I said, just something to kind of think about. Um, but otherwise, I can't think of anything that I'm really working on right now that isn't already um, public. So thanks. Thanks, Crystal. Um, so there were two questions in there I wanted to respond to. First of all, I'll turn to Barbara, because I'm assuming the agenda to go is the iPad software, which I don't have one, so I'm not familiar with it. Yes. Barbara, do it. you? Okay. Um, Barbara, do you have a response to that issue with the agendas popping up late on there? Uh, you're on mute, Barbara, if you're trying to talk. Yeah, sorry. It took me a while to get to unmute. No, Crystal, I do not know what is going on with the delay on the agenda to go. And um, we'll be doing that today, so maybe we could check in at the end of the day and see what's happening with you and Agenda to Go. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And then on the schedule adjustments, happy to talk to that. So again, this was a request made by a member to um, ensure that we're not conflicting with the school district's um, schedule of classes that they have right now. And um, so in particular, make sure that the members can attend, staff can attend, as well as members of the public um, can attend our committee meeting. So um, that's why we're uh, the Thursday trying to avoid and then certain afternoons trying to avoid. And so the clerk's office has been working with individual committee leadership to um, uh, figure out a schedule for November. Barbara, have you started reaching out to committees uh, for November time? And you're on mute if you're trying to speak. Sorry, Barbara. Mr. Chair, what, what we've done is we're going with a schedule for October, which was to move meetings not on the date that conflicted with the ASD, except we couldn't move all of them. We, we just have some conflicts. And so the conflicts were enterprise and budget are gonna stay on Thursday. CEDC made a decision to have a meeting on Thursday and I think they got Meg's permission for that one. And then the last one was um, I think I think those were the three that we could not accommodate the uh, ASD scheduling request, but the rest of them um, should all be done. Well, Felix and, and Barbara, um, actually, we moved public safety to Thursday because we couldn't have it on Wednesday 
the beginning of next month because of the change in the assembly meeting. So um, you are that correct. <laughs> and, and that is, you are correct. That one is still on Thursday. Right. And then we still have, yeah, community and economic development, but I think we were moving that to 10 o'clock um, rather than the um, nine o'clock and that that made that a little bit more palatable. Um, so anyway, so I guess there are still potentially some calendar challenges. And so I just thought maybe we need to figure out how we can clarify that for everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, Barbara and I are happy to work on any of those. I know um, <laughs> her team has been trying to, to sort through all of the all of the calendars and, and figure everything out. So um, Barbara, hopefully we can get an update on that um, soon. Um, Forrest, you're in the queue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just for, uh, remember an item that I forgot to discuss during my time. If you want me to go now or I could go later. Uh, go ahead. Uh, this is something that um, Cameron might want to speak to as well. I think Chris would have spoken about it, but I don't think he's here this morning. Um, but uh, the three of us have continued our discussions with the tribe, uh, the Klutna tribe, um, about establishing government to government relationships and uh, relationship rather. And we had a, we actually went out to Klutna and had a good meeting with their um, over the um, with their leadership. Um, we've also been speaking with the administration. So we hope to bring an item, uh, an ordinance likely uh, to the body at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, we're going to give them a chance, obviously them being the tribe, a chance to uh, look at the ordinance uh, once we've created a draft and sort of see what they want from the process too. Um, but I, I'm pretty excited about how things have gone forward, uh, the meetings this summer and then um, the meeting last week. So um, just a sort of progress report, um, Not don't have an ETA on the ordinance, um, but it is moving forward. And I, I think we'd like to get it introduced um, perhaps in December. We're not sure yet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Uh, Jamie, you had a question for Forrest? Yeah, I do. I've been working with the, I know they're completely different entities, um, but I met with the Akutna Incorporated and they're going to be doing a few things that they want to bring forward as well with the administration. But uh, Forrest, do you think you could tell us what the AO is just the topic of it? So Crystal and I are aware. Yeah, the topic will be uh, going off the resolution we passed last December involving establishing formalized government to government relationships w relationship with okay. uh, the Akuna tribe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, next, I have Suzanne. Thanks, Felix. And um, thanks to the clerk's team and welcome to the new members of the team, Christy, Heather, and Marissa. I appreciate um, the help and support. So, um, hopefully at the we will get and um, I just wanted to call attention to an amendment um, that I intend to bring forward for that AO that would um, broaden the application of the tax. Okay, and um, the next thing I'll mention is the Health Policy Committee, but I won't um, talk about that now because Meg has done the lion's share of the work in organizing speakers from the ASD and the Health Department to have a conversation, not just 19 and an update from the epidemiologists, but the school districts districts reopening plan and hopefully members saw Meg's email requesting any questions in advance. And then lastly, Felix, I see that and from our conversation, the AO that John and I are working on concerning transition of emergency declaration is later on the agenda. So I'll hold on that for now. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Forrest, you had a question? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Suzanne, I mean, the I'm sure we'll have this discussion once the amendment is brought, but I'm I we mm -hmm. might as well 
preview it here. I think we've all received those emails from various folks related to um, vaping devices and the other kind of um, loopholes or holes that, that some of the advocates see in the existing uh, ordinance and they want to close those loopholes as well. My question with the devices though is, you know, what we're doing is we're moving an exemption for an other tobacco products tax. Um, tax. Um, are there other devices, I mean, something as simple as a pipe used to smoke mm -hmm. loose tobacco, are those subject to a tax or, or, or not? Because, I mean, if, if we're talking about equity, um, I'm, I'm wondering, should we be taxing all of the devices as opposed to just the devices related to vaping? Or is there some rational way we like to differentiate them? Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Forrest. Yeah, to my knowledge, pipes and papers are not taxed, they're not included. And so the question is, why would we be inconsistent, right, and tax devices that are used for vaping? I mean, I suppose we could consider, you know, adding them all. But as far as like vaping, given that, you know, we've seen in the last few years, the numbers among high school students increase here from 19% to 26% to, I think it's safe to call epidemic levels. And we're seeing an entire you know, generation become hooked on um, tobacco products, that this puts vaping devices in, in a separate light or a different light for consideration. So um, at least that's you know one of the arguments, but I'm totally open to broadening it to include pipes and papers if that's something you know the body wants to consider. But right now, I think it is very important that we include devices to it because um, that's you know they're not they're not just purchased together. Um, that there is this this you know entire area of you know buying the devices that contributes to that use as well as liquids that are not labeled correctly um, so we need to broaden the inclusion of the liquids as well especially because that pertains to flavors which we know is what hooks young people and many of those flavors do contain nicotine and are mislabeled and there's data from the fda that shows that mislabeling Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, so going back, going back to my list. Uh, next, I have Cameron. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I've, I've got some noise in the background. If you want to skip me for a second and come back to me after the next person, then I'll be helpful. Sure, sounds good. Um, Pete? Uh, thanks, Felix. I uh, just have one item that was uh, that's going to be on our next uh, agenda um, <clears throat> that the, uh, it's uh, three, three weeks. Uh, the final election day is going to be three weeks um, from the certification, so it gives more time to get the mail ballot sent out. Uh, it was introduced at the meeting on Tuesday. It'll be on our agenda coming next Tuesday. Uh, that's all I've got right now. Uh, we are going to be having our annual uh, AML convention online starting the second week of of November, and and so I'll be. Um, probably going back and forth between some of the online meetings there and some of our online work sessions that week. Just wanted to let you know about that. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. I know we had a lot of us attend the last year's AML, um, so this is going to be different. <laughs> um, you ready, Cameron? Yep, yep, I'm ready now. Thanks. All right. Um, so I got a, a, a little list here. That, thank you, Forrest, for reporting out on the Eclutna work. So I'll just skip that because I think you did a great job um, giving an update on that. Um, public safety, um, we, I've been working on this to-do list for a while with Crystal, and um, it's just about ready to be <laughs> posted on our, our site. I'm hoping to do that 
today and to get it to Crystal and to get a final version. But essentially, it's going to be a very a rather long working list of, of issues and items that have been brought to our committee by the community or by assembly members or by uh, the police department, fire department or Department of Law that we are so that we can demonstrate that here are the things that have been brought to us. Um, it'll it'll also have an indication on it as to whether we're actively working on those or whether we've we've closed it out or whether it's something we're looking to do in the near future. So it'll give a little bit of a of a status of each one of those. And so I'm um, hoping to have that up um, uh, to, to today or tomorrow so that um, that folks can, can see it and kind of get a sense of where we're working and what's what's on our list of things to do. Um, um, we had talked a while back about developing a small group, a working group of assembly members to talk about naming and name, naming panels. I, I've been doing a fair amount of research on that. It's not high on my priority list right now because there's obviously a lot of other things on our plate. But um, I did want to say that um, I, I do want to move forward with that. My understanding was that Crystal wanted to be involved in that as well. And I, I thought it was um, um, Austin that wanted to be the, the third person. And obviously that's not going to work. So if, if there's another person who wants to be involved in that working group, um, it probably won't, won't start for a while. But just so I'll know who, who that is, uh, if you could re reach out to me, um, I'd like to kind of start to plan that in the, in, in the future. Um, also, obviously, like everybody else, I'm working on budget a lot, and um, I did want to say that that we're gonna I'm gonna start doing the report outs and the conversations with community council meetings on but budget, and I, I've got the materials that were were provided to us by the administration. But if if anybody creates anything else that they're using um, and be, would be willing to share it, any any kind of uh, talking points or slides or anything that that would be helpful, I'd love to to receive that because um, I'm going to be doing those soon. Uh, let's see, uh, being really busy right now, obviously with with Austin being out with with communication, um, trying to sort of get caught up on all of the relationships and conversations and. Um, so that's occupying a great deal right now. And then the last thing on my list is. Um, I was co contacted by a couple of teachers about. Described to me as a rumor that the assembly was going to get involved in the school closure conversation and then I was contacted by the media about that, about this rumor that the assembly was going to sort of take action related to school closure. I have not, I'm not aware of it being proposed by the assembly. And I guess I just wanted to bring it to this meeting and ask if there is, um, um, I, because I was caught off guard and um, was not have not been aware of any, any working, any work that's going on to um, engage with the school district around whether or not they should open or not. So I wanted to just sort of put that in into the group and see if there is work going on and maybe we could learn a little bit more about that. Thanks, Cameron. So um, before I get to you, Dean, just a couple things. So first is, um, so the Marissa, our communications assistant, um who we have with us until the end of the of the year did do a, a short slide show for the budget presentation to share with community councils so um cameron if you need me to send that to you again i'm happy to do that oh that'd be great thanks great and then on your second thing um <laughs> yeah uh rumors so um i think meg when she talks in a little bit we'll be able to talk about what we are doing um, which is going to be a meeting in the health policy committee, and that's going to be a meeting with the school board, with the uh, assembly, with uh, Dr. Bishop, with the Anchorage Health Department, uh, and, and I'm probably stealing Meg's thunder there. But anyway, she'll be able to talk about that and what exactly we're doing. Um, okay, so then next I have John. <laughs> um, thanks. Yeah, I'm kind of anxious to hear Meg first. That sounds like the story of the day. Um, just a few things. Community Economic Development Committee um, is still working on um, possible possible revisions. So there will certainly be revisions to marijuana code, if only to align closer with the recent state changes. But a, a variety of other things should be coming our ways in the next month or two. Um, we're also still working on the um, kind of parameters in Title 21 and um, 
for a license for um, shelters, and that's been um, going this way. More AMATS started the MTP 2050, having just finished the 2040, and with the land uh, long range transportation plan connected with that coming to us, the new one's starting, and that's a three year process. And it was really, I think, unique on that is the comments that were received at the end of the MTP 2040 that were kind of rejected as too late in the game will be brought in at the very beginning of this MTP 2050. So I'm really happy about that. I think there's a whole new attitude towards these things um, coming forward in this. Um, I think we have later in the meeting um, where I'd like to think of as EOs to AOs, where we'll try to see what can we do through ordinance instead of emergency orders. Um, I'm also working with Crystal and Dean and getting feedback from a variety of places on creating an incentive for sprinklers. So we pretty much rejected making sprinklers mandatory, which is kind of sort of what they were in that building code thing. Uh, we had a 2% um, you know, rebate for commercial buildings that had sprinklers that we pulled away not too long ago. And so I'm kind of using that as a template and seeing if that might work. And um, just a slight nudge to get, you know, encourage people who want them to get sprinklers. Um, there is in our CARES Act, we did the uh, kind of jobs program with the trails. And I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but um, one of the trails was the Hemlock Burn Trail up at um, kind of coming down from Glen Alps and going to Prospect. And that went through single track advocates to Alaska Trails to build the trail. And we were kind of thinking it was shovel ready. It was in the plans and so on, but there's a huge amount of pushback from other users up there. Um, that trail is somewhat designed to be a really awesome downhill biking trail. And the South Fork Rim Trail would be uphole only for bikes. Um, there are a lot of neighbors say, no, the plan says that all these trails should be multiple use, not designed for bikes. So it's, um, Start anyway. It's there were some details in our resolution that may not have been met using the funds in Trigas State Park and not in our state our parks. Um, so that's I don't know if you're aware, but that that could take some interesting turns. And it's just um, kind of a lesson too. You know, we really watch our details when we do those complicated resolutions. Um, and I, I think one thing there is if we have money left over in that trails funding is to use it on the South Fork Rim Trail to make some changes that might get people closer to not so mad. Um, I've also, you know, as we've seen a lot of people at the assembly, they're mad at us, but some of it is they just don't know what our routines are. And they say we're breaking the law. Well, no, that's we're following the law when we do some of those things. And it, it just they don't understand. And I've done with a few of you a presentation that I'd set up called Influ How to Influence the Assembly. And you know, I've done it for a dozen or so different groups from you know youth court and Boy Scouts up to the Chamber of Commerce and a group of realtors and so on. But I'm going to be uh, dusting that off and trying to get out there a little bit more doing that. And then we talked about maybe videotaping it and posting it somewhere. So that's something that um, I'm working on. And, and it actually works well with having one other assembly member there to kind of bounce the, the dialogue off. So I, I'd probably be inviting some of you to join in on that. So those are some highlights. Thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, that last project that John mentioned, the videotaping of a presentation, um, the only way that we're actually able to do that is thanks to Marissa being on board. So um, you can tell that that in increased staff capacity really helps us to do the types of things that the community is really demanding that we do. Um, OK, so then moving on to Meg. OK, um, thanks. Um, before I get to all the things that people are wanting to hear about, um, I would be interested if there's room on the sprinkler incentive. I had raised a similar idea and request to uh, Chris Schutte early on in that conversation. Um, so if there's room, sign me up. <clears throat> um, on school reopening plan, um, the plan is for next Wednesday's health policy committee meaning to be um, slightly different, more like a joint meeting with ASD and the assembly. It's been uh, noticed for an additional half hour. Um, it's been noticed to go through teams, be like a team's live event. So assembly members, presenters, school board members, school district staff will be on the one side and then we'll be able to have a public facing version of the team's meeting. Um, so presentations can be seen by the public. Um, 
and um, I'm, I'm thinking just with the interest, uh, that would be good. Um, the framework for the meeting is to start with um, a general COVID update from the health department, as well as get let us meet our new epidemiologist, uh, Dr. Janet Johnson. Um, so we're going to start there, and then we're going to overlay the reopening plan, particularly with the questions towards what effects, if any, would the reopening plan have on municipal resources, such as contact tracing, hospital capacity, and just make sure that we're looking holistically. Um, there was the request, if you have questions in that regard, um, to go ahead and send those um, my way or uh, to Carissa at the clerk's office and I'll compile them. I'd like to get them out on Monday. I think people will be rather distracted perhaps on Tuesday. Um, so that there's time to get answers so we don't have to do a bunch of follow up out of the meeting on Wednesday. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about how that meeting is going to work. The idea, um, even though it's not like our typical joint meetings, but when we get to that second item on the agenda um, or throughout will be that um, board members as well as assembly members will be able to hop in the queue um, and ask questions. Um, I'm really hoping it's a very open dialogue um, about what it all means <laughs> and how it all might work together since we um, have been receiving a lot of emails um, in our email as well. Um, on the shelter licensing, we've kind of run up against uh, capacity issues with regard to COVID and just some of the work um, that Dean is being asked to do. So we're moving along. Um, right now we're at a point where um, we're waiting for Dean to go in and look at the draft that um, Chris, John and I have put together. And then after that's done, it'll go on to the health department. I also have a few questions out to um, the shelter community about kind of how their hiring operations work and whether or not they do background checks or get fingerprints. Um, and if so, what does that look like for them? Why do they do that? Um, similarly, if they're accredited, what accreditation do they have? What does that mean? Um, because we want to get as familiarized with the nuts and bolts of their operations as we can um, as we consider um, this ordinance. Um, other than that, I'm just working on the budget. I don't have any other uh, particular um, legislation um, I'm working on. I thank you all in advance um, in terms of some of the scheduling. Um, I know that when my daughter's on school and I'm on our team's meeting, um, I have a hard time doubly attending to both. Um, and we're still at that age category where um, some support is needed. Um, so, but I'm happy to answer any questions about anything that's going on um, on either the health policy. Um, oh, and for the homelessness committee, we have a re-entry presentation slated for November, but that's currently all we have on the agenda. So if there's a topic or an issue you would like addressed, um, please flag it for me and I will uh, track it down and we'll see if we can add it to the agenda. Thanks. Thanks, Meg. <clears throat> All right, I'll go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Dean. I, I totally skipped. Uh, so, Dean, you had a comment? And this was a while ago. Um, yes, that's okay. It's sort of timely after Meg's comment. Um, so, generally, uh, I wanted to mention about a school's opening and closures and uh, in general, the operations and the opening and closing of schools is uh, committed to the jurisdiction of the school board. And um, that's by our charter and by um, Alaska state law and under Title 17. Um, now, I think that uh, the assembly spending time um, discussing or debating about, you know, opening, closing schools. It's good to be informed and all of that, but I don't think they have the authority to do, to make any like um, decision or ordinance or resolution about school closures, um, other than to say we urge the school board or so forth. However, um, I'm discussing this with legal, so take that comment with a grain of salt. Um, additionally, there might be that more general uh, 
orders or regulations that apply to the public generally, they might affect schools under their umbrella. Um, anyways, uh, but we need to remember we have a school board for a reason. Uh, and so there is a legal question here, as well as, of course, all of the policy considerations that people have. Thanks. Uh, Jamie? Yeah, thank you, Felix. Let me, I have to slip back into my notes. So I don't know if everybody's aware, and I agree with Dean, um, we're the assembly, we're not the school board. Just received an email as Meg was speaking, as a matter of fact, in regards to the schools opening back up and that it sounds like the unions are on board to support those teachers to do it. Um, and that came straight from uh, Corey Ace. He's president of the Anchorage Education Association. And of course, those teachers who did that said, please don't use our names because they're afraid of the repercussions from their union. But I do have an email and I don't know if anybody else has seen it, but it does come from Adam Crum, who is the commissioner of uh, Department of Health Social Services, and he says that they don't review nor approve plans for school districts. We are available to talk with them, but it's up to the school districts. And Commissioner Johnson and Dr. Zink are, are constantly telling schools how important it is to get kids back in school in person. We presented this last week that ages 1 through 14 have adverse effects from more adverse effects from influenza and COVID. So I just hope that the assembly... Um, knows that is the their medical advisors, Dr. Zink and uh, Commissioner Johnson, the educational advisor, and that's coming down from the state. So I want to continue to support Dr. Dina Bishop and her decision and respect her decision and what the school board decides as well. Um, and I just wanted to thank Meg for all of her hard work and trying to figure out a happy medium with all the teachers and the families. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and um, so Su Suzanne is asking when was the email from the teachers union sent to us? Uh, I don't believe it was an email that was sent to all of us. It might have been just an email sent to Jamie. Uh, is that correct, Jamie? Yes, it was a teacher that shared the information that the union, I, I could definitely um, forward it. I would, I would just personally, I'll black out the person's name who sent it and I could give it to all the assembly members if they'd like to see it. It's no problem. Great. Yeah, if you want to work through the clerk's office to get that to us, that's great. Um, okay, so then um, I'll go ahead and do my report. Uh, so not much in addition to report to all of the things I'm doing as chair and trying to just keep us moving forward. Um, I just based on the uh, Frank who came to speak to us uh, at the assembly meeting on uh, whenever that assembly meeting was Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. Um, he uh, had some concerns about tutor and this has been like a decades long issue. So uh, I am trying to see if there's something new that we can do there with the state. And I've reached out to Senator Gray Jackson and Representative Josephson to see if um, we can stop spinning on the hamster wheel on this issue and actually get something done. Um, otherwise, yeah, I'm just focusing mainly on constituent issues that have come up. Um, I am starting to mull over, emphasis on mull over and think about it. So. I haven't asked Dean uh, or Dennis to draft anything. Um, a potential charter change to deal with the issues that Jamie and Cameron and others have brought up regarding um, being unable to fill, uh, temporarily fill Austin's uh, seat uh, that is empty but not vacant in a very weird fashion because the charter has a doesn't speak to it. Um, so that's just, again, something that I'm thinking about. So if anyone wants to join me in mulling and thinking it over, feel free to uh, reach out to me. Happy to have more company on that. Um, that is it for me, though, on individual stuff. Um, okay, so then moving on to uh, our next item under other items, the 2021 proposed budget. So 
Um, we've completed our main work sessions on the budget. We still have two more, one on the alcohol tax and then one on amendments. So unless I hear otherwise, I'm not going to be planning on scheduling any additional work sessions. So I guess, you know, open question to the body. Are any further work sessions necessary or are we all just pretty much doing our individual work at this time? Any thoughts on that? All right, not hearing anyone that I'm just going to assume that we're just doing our individual work and I won't schedule any more work sessions, which is great because I don't know where, when we're going to find the time. Um, okay, so then uh, moving on to the, the big topic, emergency declaration discussion. So um, let me just share my screen. Okay. So, uh, hold on. Bam. All right, so be before we begin this discussion, I want to set a couple of guidelines. So first, this is a, a process discussion and not necessarily a policy discussion. We'll have the policy discussion and votes at an assembly meeting. Um, second, this is all sort of under development and part of discussions which really began this week. So this is very fresh and absolutely open to change. All right, so let's go ahead and walk through the process as I understand it, and then I'm going to be inviting John, Suzanne, Dean, and Dennis, who I hope Dennis Wheeler is still with us, uh, to chime in and add to this. So, um, and feel free to correct me, uh, Dennis and Dean and John and Suzanne, if I say anything wrong. Um, all right, so here's the process as I understand it after talking with the administration. Suzanne and John, Dean and Dennis. So on October 13th, we discussed the need to transition from emergency declaration to something more permanent. Um, as John put it, from EOs to AOs, um, we amended the extension of the emergency declaration to reflect this desire. So John and Suzanne have begun working with the administration, assembly council and Dennis Wheeler to craft an ordinance to achieve the goal that was set on October 13th. My goal is once a draft is done, we can I will call a rules committee meeting to review the draft, which is normal practice for this committee. We just haven't done it much recently. Then after review of a draft, we introduce the ordinance. Our initial thinking was at a special meeting on November 16th, where we will have a presentation to explain what we are doing and why. We can double up on the 16th to have a public hearing on a possible extension of the emergency declaration because as we were debating on October 13th, there was an amendment that was passed that required two weeks uh, notice of a public hearing before the end of the emergency declaration. So November 30th is the end, two weeks before November 30th. Uh, so the soonest we could have the public hearing is November 16th. So what happens after November 16th? That is where things get a little tricky. Do we need to have an ordinance done and voted on by November 30th when the current emergency declaration expires? Or do we have more time to get this done? That is an open question for discussion, and that's what we're here for. I think that's probably going to take the remainder of our time. Before we do open discussion, though, I want to ask John and Suzanne to speak to any of the work that you've done, and then we can open it up to Dennis and Dean to add anything that they would like. So John and Suzanne. Go ahead, Suzanne. I was going to say, go ahead, John. <laughs> Thanks. John just took a bite <laughs> of his sandwich. <laughs> Fair enough. OK, so um, as Felix mentioned, this is still, I mean, obviously very early on in the development. And we've had some initial meetings this week, and I actually haven't had an opportunity to talk with um, Dennis on the draft and haven't seen the draft, but the intent, of course, is to um, take a legislative approach with some of these bigger um, aspects of the emergency orders, like business closures and mask um, mandates, 
and to, you know, go through the, the public process for it, to put some rails on around, you know, the health emergency and um, the powers that the mayor has. I'd also add to that another aspect of it, um, you know, depending how this shakes out, that we'll need to discuss concerns establishing a quorum of the assembly. Since, you know, we had made a change early on in the year that when there is a local, state, or federal emergency, the quorum of assembly members can be established with a combined total of members physically and telephonically present. So I think that's also something to keep in mind when um, we look at, you know, what we can do under an emergency declaration. So I'll stop there, John, you want to add? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, the uh, a lot, some of this is not new to us. Uh, when this first uh, we first caught wind of this pandemic, the administration came, mayor's team, um, with an ordinance that we um, that really uh, said, "What do we do?" You know, the charter kind of seems to envision that there's rioting on the streets, and how do you handle that? And not so much a health emergency. So we wrote into code um, parameters for how you would handle a health emergency and really put limitations on it. So in some ways I see this um, as an expansion on that. Now that we know more, eight months later, we go, oh, this is what we deal with and set some guidelines for, you know, when are business closures appropriate? When are things like mass or who knows what another pandemic might lead to, um, you know, things like that, individual actions to help the community, you know, where, where do those kick in? So uh, kind of look at it that way, you know, and as far as timing, that took us a while to do. Um, we had a, a large number of amendments and Omeg was very, very busy on it. And I think we landed in a good place for what we knew at the time. So I would be skeptical to think we could really have something um, really done, maybe pieces of it, but I can't imagine having the whole thing done by the end of November. Uh, with just a couple of meetings, but but we should work towards that, and you know potentially then ex extend the emergency powers through the end of the year. But you know we're still working on you know bringing the EOs into AOs. So, and and that anyway. So that's uh, you know we met with the administration, we met with Dennis and Dean, and we're kind of working that way. Thanks. Thanks, John. So before I turn it over to Dean and Dennis, um, and, and maybe Dean can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so I asked Dean, when could we get a draft of this type of ordinance? And he did think that a draft of this type of ordinance could be ready committee review um, by sometime uh, next week or probably the week after, which is amazing to me. Um, but I will go ahead and let Dean and Dennis um, uh, add. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I will just comment that I made a rough estimate when you asked me, Mr. Chair, um, and uh, Dennis is working on this. It's on his plate, so I will let him answer us to time and uh, to, I guess, uh, add anything else he wanted to about this project. So uh, passing this to Dennis. Thanks, Dean. Through the chair, I have created an outline covering the subject areas that I think need to be incorporated in the discussion. Dean's reviewed my outline and made suggestions. My intention is to have a discussion draft uh, completed over the weekend so I can get that done. So the assembly has as much time as I can possibly give it to, to work on this. I will say that as currently envisioned, the concept draft really turns the currently effective orders into something the assembly body has adopted as its own through a legislative process and public hearing, et cetera. It does not, therefore, at this point, add any new requirements or restrictions or eliminate or deem no longer effective any of the current orders in place. So, so those kinds of decisions would be left to the body as it moves forward. And I recognize that we were anticipating some decision from the state here in the next couple of weeks. And that too may have some influence on what the body is going to do with this, but uh, I do anticipate turning this back over to Dean for his final review um, so he can have that early next week. Thanks so much, Dennis. 
All right, so I'm going to read a couple of comments not related to this topic, and then I'll go through the queue. Um, so Alex Slifka um, made a comment. Vaping the S version does not tax the device, which is in alignment with no tax currently on pipes. Susanna made a comment. Yes, the amendment proposes taxing vaping devices when sold separately. All right, so we'll go ahead and go back to this discussion topic, uh, starting with Forrest. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'll start with a comment and then a question. I think you asked a question and perhaps it was rhetorical about do we need to have this ordinance ready to go by November 30th when we set that deadline? The answer is clearly no. Um, that deadline was set by ourselves with a resolution, you know, two meetings ago. And since then, there's been real world changes. Um, you know, we did that before the uh, number of infections exploded um, and and before the number of ICU beds started to really fall. And now, of course, today we see we had four deaths in a day and um, it's it seems to be accelerating. And so, you know, we can take the real world uh, circumstances into effect, and we can pass another AR on the 30th or the weekend, uh, the meeting before the 30th, and um, we can change things for ourselves. And specifically in an emergency, the 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 assembly chair could also call an emergency meeting. We could do it any day, and we could extend the emergency declaration if we felt it was necessary. So. Um, I think it's good that we try that we're trying to do this work, but we shouldn't act like it's in code. It was a resolution that we passed and a resolution that we can um, overrule if we think it is wise to do so with a simple majority of the of the assembly members. Um, the question I have is for Dean and Dennis, and I, I think I know the answer to this question, but I just kind of want to hear you reiterate it. Um, you know, I was on an email thread with um, uh, Kate Vogel and I think Dean was there too, but there was a discussion. I think John might have been there too with some questions, a discussion about this with the administration, the administration's legal team. And I just want to hear how and if the administration's legal team has been um, part of this discussion because obviously it very much affects them and they have very specific knowledge about things like union contracts and uh, purchasing and the other things that the emergency <laughs> declaration allows them to do. Thank you. So I guess that's for Dennis or Dean. I could also address that. Well, I would yeah, like to we can probably address it. <laughs> so, Dean, do you want to start, and then and then John or I could address it because we all know the answer. Uh, yes, my response right now was basically that, of course, there's a lot of questions and concerns but uh i don't think that we're ready to you know describe all our discussions that were pretty much uh privileged and confidential at this point but yes we are talking to the administration about this ordinance and um so for so there is some alignment but i don't really think that right now today is the appropriate time to talk about where we are, what we've talked about, and what the issues are, and so forth. Legally, we need to flesh these out a little more before we're prepared to do that. Um, so uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Dunbar, but I'm just asking for your patience. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm going to go around the council then and go directly to the clients. Uh, Ms. LaFrance and Mr. Weddleton, do you want, have anything else you <laughs> want to add to that over the advice of council? Uh, Mr. Chair, may I? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, John. OK, um, yeah, well, I won't go over the advice of counsel. I mean, we have um, uh, talked about it with um, Kate and the others, but I think to your points on, uh, you know, can we do the collective bargaining agreement things and, and override the purchasing and so on? You know, I, I don't know that those things we're not trying to take emergency powers away from the mayor. We can't really. And those things are part of that. But those aren't the things that really. Um, have most of the most you know people riled up and to me aren't the biggest concerns it is the things that um are viewed as infringing on individual rights for the community good and that's things like you know business closures and mask mandates and occupancy limits and things like that and you know where would the parameters on those things be and and not get into as you point out things that would be really hard for us to do um I don't think that those are the focus of the general population and not the highest level issues either. Can, can I uh, respond to that, Mr. Chair, really quickly? Sure. 
Thank you. Um, I appreciate that, John. And um, and if Suzanne, you have something you, you, different you'd you'd like to communicate, I'd love to hear from you too. But I think that um, that's that's all good. That all sounds great. But I think it also conceptually, I think there is a perception from some members of the public that we are doing this so that we can end the emergency or declaration, if that makes sense. That is, we can lay these things down in code and that's, and then end the emergency declaration and it'll be okay because these structures will be in place to keep some of the health measures in place. But what you just articulated is the need to both do this ordinance and potentially extend the, the health, the de declared emergency. And there are people in the public for whom just the sort of notion of a declared emergency is seen as an infringement on their rights. Um, and I'm, I'm not sort of making a normative judgment on that right now, but I just think it's something that we should be prepared for. That is, if if it does if we cannot address things like collective bargaining and purchasing, which I think you're right, we can't through a, uh, through an ordinance quickly. Um, that that means we're going to have a very powerful need for an emergency declaration, even with this ordinance in place. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Um, and also, I think um, Forrest, you had asked if the questions I asked were um, rhetorical or not, and the answer to that is no, they're not rhetorical. Um, so, um, Suzanne, I know Forrest had asked you if you wanted to weigh in, so do you have anything to add? Thanks, Felix. I mean, I agree with the points, you know, John raised that definitely, yeah, we don't want to lose some of these smaller, so-called smaller things you know, with preventing AWU shutoffs and being able to stand up the soul of an arena. And I agree, that's not what um, people are objecting to. I guess I would just say at this point, you know, um, since it's still being developed, I I'm trying to get a better understanding of what options we have and, and how, you know, we can work out those issues. And maybe, and maybe we can't, maybe we still are in a place where we've got an emergency order um, declaration continuing. I don't know, but I'm still looking at what those options um, might be, and I'm eager to hear, you know, get more into the discussion with the attorneys. Thank you. Thanks. All right, going back in the queue, Meg. Um, thanks. So I think that last nuanced point that for um, particularly in terms of communicating expectations is really important. Um, I also think in terms of timing, just looking at the realities of our schedule um, and the like, um, that I think we need to, for all practical purposes, consider what it may mean to work through continuing the emergency declaration so that we're not rushing ordinances that we plan to have sticking around for a lot longer and that take a little bit more to tweak after the fact if they're passed. Um, and we should give all, I guess, due time and deliberation. And I'm not suggesting they're being overly rushed, but due time and deliberation to make sure they're going to do what um, they're intended to do um, and that we get that really good opportunity, you know, to vet those. Um, so we're hopefully not um, amending them a lot on the fly or on the floor, um, because that is one of my concerns. Um, but I will say that for my purposes, the most important thing at this point, the information I'm missing, and I understand it's not quite here yet, is kind of a table or an analysis of what can be covered by ordinance and under what circumstances versus what requires an emergency declaration. Um, and also to layer on kind of one more potential complicating factor is, does that change if the state does not continue its emergency declaration past November 15th? I heard at the press conference earlier this week, uh, hospitals are concerned you know, about their own licensure requirements um, to expand or for staffing if there's not a state emergency declaration. You know, wh where do their, where does their emergency impact things or la or one that's not declared versus what we can potentially fill in at the municipal level or we just have no authority? I really need that fulsome picture. So, and I know that's gonna be a little while in coming, but um, I think in terms of thinking about a path forward, it's really hard to contemplate that until we have um, that analysis. Thanks. Thanks. 
next I have Crystal. Well, actually, I forget why I put myself in a queue now, but I will comment that I really appreciate Meg's comment because that has been my biggest frustration. So if we get something as specific as an outline like uh, she was re was uh, recommending, I would absolutely think that that would be really helpful in terms of helping the public understand as well as helping us understand exactly uh, how we should move forward in any kind of um, uh, ordinances. So thank you. Thanks. And yeah, just a comment. Uh, that's absolutely been a lot of the discussions between Dean, Dennis and the administration. So hopefully we can we can get very uh, good clarity on that question soon. Uh, Jamie. Thank you, Felix. A couple of things I just I keep getting these. I don't know why it happens during our work sessions, but I just got alerted that the coroner's office or excuse me, medical examiner's office. Maybe that's what they call it here. Um, firsthand knowledge and I'm going to call down there as soon as we're done with this but I was just told that they're four months behind in inputting COVID cases which means that the spike has actually come and gone but I'm going to verify that um, to find out if that's accurate or not so that's very important to know and then number two as far as I guess I can go back with Meg I did too inquire about what does it mean if the state no longer has an emergency uh, proclamation in place and from what I was told that the administration of uh, the municipality can keep one in place but the backlash or the um, how do I uh, the ability to prove it if the rest of the state is not locked down or under emergency orders um, is going to be it could bring on um, a lot of anguish for our administration. So that's what I do know. And I got that firsthand from the state and I'm sure the administration is going to follow up. But from what I get, from what I gather, they said that we could still technically have one in place. But the coroner report or the medical examiner's report is very concerning to me. So if in fact they are four months behind and the spike really did come and go already, um, because I don't see the numbers increase at the ICU, I've been calling and keeping up with that. Um, it concerns me. So I just hope we take all those things into consideration if we decide to extend the emergency proclamation and, and all the orders. Uh, thank you, Felix. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, Suzanne? Thanks, Felix. Um, you know, to the, the point that Jamie just raised, I'm wondering if there's someone from the administration who might be able to address that now. I mean, given the heightened state of concern, um, I certainly would not want to you know, put out any information to the public that could be confusing or alarming. So if there's anyone who could, you know, speak to that now, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, I don't know if we have that mix of folks here at this meeting. But uh, Suzanne, if you want to reach out to the administration and then feel free to um have that be, be sent to the entire assembly that's uh, helpful thanks oh, felix. actually jason jason is on here so maybe he does know <laughs> yeah felix this is this is jason um and through the chair uh, uh assembly member la france i i am I, I don't know anything about this uh backlog at the medical examiner's office but i can uh very clearly tell the body that um the cases that we are reporting um, every single day in Anchorage are completely up to date. I mean, these are being put out by the state um, and reported by the state, and we pass those on. So the surge in cases is very much real today um, and isn't something from multiple months ago. I think maybe what um, the medical examiner's office is, is catching up to might be reporting of some of the deaths um, and and reporting them that they are COVID related, uh, but I I would have to look into that aspect of it. But I can 100% tell you that the surge in cases is 100% real and happening in real time. Thanks. 
All right, so unless there's any other discussion on process. So um, as I stated in the presentation, um, I'm going to be waiting for a draft from Dennis and from Dean. Once I get that draft, then I'll likely be calling a rules committee meeting so we can start looking at the draft. Because from my perspective, I really want us to hammer these things out um, in draft form before we put something out to the public. Um, that then has to be amended a thousand times. Um, OK, uh, go ahead, Meg. Thanks, Felix. So can you just lay out a little bit um, on the timing? Are, are we going to be noticing um, soon a special public hearing for purposes of the emergency declaration for November 16th? Um, and then we're going to wait and see what the timing for the AO is separately, or are we going to wait and see what the timing is for the AO and see if that happens to align? I guess I just need some clarification, or if it's unknown at this point, that's fine too. I just didn't know if we were going to come out with a timeline or not from today. Yeah, it, it, it's somewhat unknown because um, so my goal is to, on November 16th, have that public hearing on the possible extension of the emergency declaration. I will tell you that I don't think anyone, I will speak for myself, I haven't talked to the administration about a possible extension of the emergency declaration and how long that might be. I know that there are concerns that our council has about um, how long we should extend an emergency declaration and I will let our council talk about that. But um, you know, the hope is <clears throat> that at, at the same time that we have the emergency declaration that we're able to talk at least, maybe we don't have a draft that's even ready uh, to be introduced of the, the Weddleton uh, La France ordinance, but at least to be able to talk in general terms because you know there is a, a perception of the public, like Forrest was talking about, that um, there's an expectation that we are transitioning away from emergency de declaration, and so I think we need to be able to talk about that on the 16th um, and weave that that story so that the public can understand what the heck we're doing. So I'm sorry, just to make sure I understand, something's happening on the 16th. The extent of that, though, we just don't know yet. Bingo. <laughs> OK, good. Got it. Thank you. All right, not seeing anyone else um, in the queue. So let's go ahead and move on then uh, in our agenda. Thanks for that discussion. It's helpful on some of these very complex processes to talk about that uh, and get some guidance on it. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, next we have unfinished business. There's nothing under unfinished business. Uh, we will move on to audience participation. Um, so let me just look. I, I know we have two members of the public. Uh, go ahead, or maybe just one. Go ahead, Mr. Haberman. OK, um, let me get my timer right. Okay, number one, uh, thank you. My name is Eugene Carl Haberman, and you know I follow your meetings very closely. Um, number one, um, the, uh, you know, you have a site for the Rules Committee. I look at that. There's nothing, no agenda, or nothing for this meeting, so the public's working, we're going blind to what you're discussing until you discuss it, and you need to put it on the Rules Committee. Uh, website so the public can see. Second is there is a couple work sessions that follow this meeting today. I uh, just see just in the last few minutes just saw you post something in reference to one of the two, but again the public's work, working blind and there's no documents or nothing. And then uh, in closure, okay, um, your last item that you discussed today dealing with the um, emergency order. Uh, staff that you're in and uh, developing some legislation and uh, due dates that uh, uh, you were going to have public hearing. Um, now, in this discussion with the public hearing, you say of a delay because you're running out of time. I can't help but notice this. The most significant item that you addressed today in this meeting 
was one of the, was the last item on the agenda and should have been first because you promised the public a few weeks ago when extending the emergency situation that you're committed to have public hearings and a due date and all that stuff. But it appears to me following what you've done is you put this in the back burner somewhere later on and you're going to go to the public and say, okay, we need more time. But there's frustration out there among the public. And uh, the issue is who's taking the responsibility in dealing with this emergency? You transfer that over to the uh, as assembly members, you transfer it over to the, to the mayor. And the public is saying, wait a minute now. And you're, you're dodging the situation of addressing it and having a full discussion with the public about it. And not some resolution. And I note this a public hearing. I would caution you, if you're going to have that item as a meeting, one item, nothing else on the agenda, so you don't line up this, that item at 11 o'clock at night and you want to hear the public on that particular item. You need to give time to this scenario for the public to respond. And certainly this last minute and delay is going to only give more frustration to the public out there as what's going on. Thank you, and I wish you all the best. Thank you, Mr. Hayriven. <clears throat> Is there anyone else from the public who would like to speak? Is there anyone else from the public who would like to speak? All right, not seeing anyone. Um, Barbara did uh, put something in the chat regarding a um, the chair report is on the website. Uh, um, so for any members uh, of the body or the public who would like to see um, the chair report, you can find that on the website. Um, OK, so with that, I will go ahead and uh, adjourn our um, the rules committee meeting and see you all at 110. Thank you.